Good morning. So today we are going to continue our series from Charles Fillmore on prosperity. And this is for July 26, 2020. And we are covering chapter seven and eight of prosperity. And the um, joke that actually my brother told me a long time ago, my younger brother, he said, um, when we're dealing with chapter seven and eight is, why was six afraid of seven? And that's because seven, eight, nine. I know, pretty bad. Anyway, chapter seven is God has provided prosperity for every home and chapter eight is God will pay your debts. Now that sounds like a pretty tall order and it's exciting to know how Charles Fillmore shows us precisely how to do that. So I once heard a minister say, pay attention to what you're paying attention to. And that's the journey we're gonna be exploring today. So recently I was asked to stretch beyond my own comfort zone. And what I noticed was there was this looming dragon of fear and of doubt that were in front of me. And I was invited to go instead into my heart. And at first it just seemed really hard because what was instead looming was this dragon. And what Charles Fillmore said is where we look from is how we see, we, we perceive and see reality. So if I'm looking from the fire breathing dragon, I'm gonna see reality very different than if I'm looking from inside my heart. And Charles Fillmore said, you must prepare your consciousness for the inflow of your good. So in chapter seven, where he says, God has provided prosperity for every home. And of course we know our home is where our heart is. He says, look to see what is occupying the space around you and the space in your heart. And he says thoughts actually occupy space. And if we think about it, we need to ask ourselves, are we crowding our mind, our heart, our thought, our environment with thought currents that are supportive or not? And just to notice what thoughts are occupying the space with you. And he invites us to create a positive thought environment or thought family um, into our home to be magnetizing and bringing to us our good. And he said that thoughts are very magnetic. And when we think thoughts well, thoughts actually become little entities and they think after their kind and where we give it power is why we, when we bring it our attention. So he said, just like a gardener would be very careful about which seeds to plant in a garden. Obviously, it wouldn't be planting weeds. But to, for us to also have that same kind of care as to what thought seeds that we're planting into our home. And so he said, one of them is the words and the thoughts that we think after. Those are actually seeds that we're planting into this world that we then occupy. And he said, actually, when we talk about expressions of lack, we actually demagnetize are good and magnetize us towards the things that maybe not may not be for our highest good. Remember an old commercial that said, if you want someone to hear what you have to say, whisper. And I think that was E.F. Hutton. But 
the idea is, is that the walls are listening. Everything is listening to the thought vibrations that we're sending out and then bringing back to us. Thoughts held in mind, reproduce after its kind, like producing its like. Charles Filmer says that fear is the breeding ground for poverty and lack. I remember when I went to Europe and I would go into these cathedrals that were just hundreds, if not one, this one church over a thousand years old, the thought energy of all that prayer and meditation and stillness, as I walked in, I could just feel it imbued in the, in the atmosphere. Of course, it made me feel peaceful going in there. And on contrast, when I went to Austria and went to the concentration camp in Mauthausen, you could also feel a whole different kind of energy that was still very present, those thought atmospheric uh, currents are present in the environment. So he said, we, in order to attract our good, we need to move from love of money to love of God. And that's where we bring lasting reward as well as attracting those th thought currents that will support us. So recently, I was thinking about how much we actually look to the outer for our good. And of course, you know, you're surviving in this world. However, usually lasting prosperity is an inside job. And I was listening recently to a lecture by Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote The Fifth Agreement. And his name, actually it was uh, Don Jose Ruiz. And he's a shaman. He was raised in the Toltec tradition. And even though he was raised in that lineage, he actually um, rejected it when he was young and turned instead to the world of drugs. And he became an addict. And he said he realized that his own personal view of reality had to shift when it almost killed him. And he said that he noticed that he had to take time to unlearn what was taking his inspiration away from him. And he said, we get tempted by suffering. We get addicted to suffering. And we enter into this dream of suffering by what he called by the parasite mind. And he said the parasite mind is born of us being conditioned by wounding. And what we would rather do is betray ourselves and turn to the parasite mind rather than face the unknown. And we give our power away to this parasite mind. And we will disrespect ourselves and listen to this part of us as if it's the only voice that's around inside us. There's a quote that everyone sits in the prison of our own ideas from which we have to burst forth from. So he said how we heal ourselves from this parasite mind is um, well, there's a book, though, that actually talks about the effects of what happens with that. It's from the book called The Book of the Body of Life by Thomas Hanna. And what he's talked about is there was a study in 1954 where he took a group of people, and what he did was he attached the um, EMG little electrodes to their forehead, and he was having them listen to a really good detective story. And just where it got to the most suspenseful place, what happened is that they noticed that the tension in their forehead was also corresponding to the tension in the story. And they found that the EMG uh, tension dropped when the story got resolved. Or if the story was interrupted, 
that tension didn't go down until the story was resol resolved. And then there was another study that was done later at McGill University where they took two groups of people and the per this professor, it was students, and the professor had told the students a particular, actually they showed them a particular picture and they asked them to tell a story about it. So half the group, when they told them the story about what they saw in this picture, half the group, the professor just praised them. And what they noticed is there was a little tension before they talked to the professor, but as soon as the professor praised them, the tension went down. With the other half, what he did was he criticized them. And what they noticed with, again, the same um, idea of recording the electrodes and the tension is that until someone came up to these people and said, hey, that was just an experiment, this is, this is what they were doing, only then would the tension subside. So how many times do we live in a tension that we don't give time to resolve? We can think of, oh yeah, I accomplished that one thing, but I've got 10 more things to do. How many times do we actually stop to just acknowledge yeah, I did that. If we don't, our nervous system eventually becomes exhausted and distorted and then we end up with anxiety or chronic pain or disease. And they talked about in the study how much neurological and psychological um, long-lasting effects can happen if we don't change the thought current and how much our thought, I didn't say thought current, but how much our thoughts actually affect our lives. So there's a saying, what if we, our heart of course is where, our home is where our heart is. And what if we were to just appreciate in the moment just what we have already experienced and what we already have gone through and to just take the time to um, value where we are right now. We're always looking at where we have to go or what we haven't done, but to just take the moment to relax into what this moment and the blessings that it offers. In chapter eight, Charles Fillmore talks about how God will pay our debts. And he said, the law is that one thought must be dissolved in order for another thought to take its place. And he says, the way we do that is through forgiveness. And if we find it hard to, for to forgive, I always remember, um, something I actually shared a while ago, which is ask God to forgive through us. For God to forgive ourselves or to forgive a situation or to forgive another. So Fillmore says, search through your mind for any unforgiving thoughts because those thoughts become an entity that we will actually give and breathe life into and will perpetuate after their kind. They will become I am actual beings that want to thrive on what actually fed them into existence. So if it was something negative, it's going to feed on negative. And if it's something positive, it will feed on that kind of nourishment or food as well. But it's what we give power to. So Fillmore says, tell me what kind of thoughts you're holding in your mind, and I will tell you what your world, your finances, your home life, your harmony in your environment and what your health is. So I was speaking before about Don Reeves. And he was talking about how do we heal from these negative habits, these par this parasite mind. You thought I wasn't going to get back to it. Well, he says, you imagine yourself 
waking up from a world full of stories of mankind. Imagine you see storyteller walkers. And in some ways, they are like people of the walking dead, though they're living, because they're living in the past, and they're not being present. And he says, see these storyteller walkers, and after all, he says, we make up our stories in our head, whether they're positive or negative. And he says, don't let yourself get trapped in the nightmare of your old judgments or your old um, wounds. Because he says, actually, when we judge ourselves or we judge another, they're really not real. And they're certainly not really real in this moment. And he says, it's just telling story. We're just being another storyteller walker. And the physician Lisa Raken said, how we change our negative habits or our negative stories rather than suppressing them or ignoring them is realize that they are needs that we that need to be met and we have up until now met them in a particular way whether they've served us or not and so she said they've been trying to protect us from places in us that have felt vulnerable and they've been effective in keeping us safe up until a point and ask yourself when you're eating that extra bowl of ice cream or whatever the habit may be is how is it trying to get my needs met to get really curious and actually to have compassion for that part of us even through our negative habits and she said, appreciate its simple wisdom of how it's trying to work with you. And when we stop demonizing our negative habits and instead loosen the grip of judging it, then what starts to happen is that we then allow space for the creative mind in us to show us other ways our needs can be met. But if we keep judging it, hammering away at it, it's not going to loosen its grip on us. So she says, criticizing and condemning ourselves or another just works against us. Both of them said, both uh, Ruiz and Lisa said, we have to bring divinity into the darkness. We have all the tools we have inside and it's right here going inside our heart with that compassion or even inside another with compassion, knowing they are trying to or trying finding ways to actually feel safe. And when we go inside the heart with that tenderness, this is where the healing occurs. When we go and touch those vulnerable places and this is where we make a masterpiece of heart. When Charles Fillmore talked about God will pay your debts. And many of you know um, Reverend Cindy Ferris. She told me a story about how back in 2006, she had a medical procedure done that cost, she had a bill of $1,392. And she said she was kind of new at that time to the idea of prosperity and about faith and having God pay our debts. And so she decided to put her faith and trusting that a way would be shown out of no way because she didn't know how she was gonna have the money for that. And here it is in 2006, and she came across a box of um, things that she had to go through, and in it she found 
a wedding card from the mid-1980s. I think it was 1986. And as she opened this wedding card to someone she wasn't married to anymore, she found in there a card that had been unopened with a $20 bill. And very shortly after that, she received a refund from her dentist in the form of $90 because she had actually double paid. And then right after that came a refund check that she had overpaid her escrow. It was actually a refund of her escrow account, not that she had overpaid it, but the her escrow account had given her from her mortgage a refund. And all of those totaled up to thirteen. dollars the amount that she had owed for her medical procedure. So Fillmore says, be thankful for every blessing given to you, even how little, and see it as a treasure house being just landed on your lap. And the that you give thanks for the little that you have, and even for that which is still in the mind of God, still unseen, but giving thanks for it already. This is where you rush the demonstration to you and declare that that which you seek is already there in spirit. See that sustenance everywhere. And not only affirm it for yourself, but affirm it for everyone else especially those either that you owe to or those that owe you. Because as you extend that blessing, you get to actually realize a certain truth, that there really is no us and other, that really we actually exist one field, disguise the one disguised as the many. And so as you bless others, that prosperity returns. And as we forgive ourselves our debts, then we're more easily able to forgive others their debts. So he said, send forgiving thoughts and what is owed to you will be paid. And he says, I owe anyone nothing but love. And he says, pay your debts with love. It is the only debt you really owe. It's pretty radical. Now, I'm not saying, and he's not saying, ignore your creditors and send them a little hard instead of paying your bills. But he's saying, if you do the inner work, bless your bills, bless whatever is owed to you or whatever, or whatever you owe. And what happens is that instead of holding covetous or hoarding thoughts, what you're doing is you're freeing into motion that love and that blessing and those blessings. And then it activates when we send out the debt of love and increase our flow of love, then it actually changes our thought current in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And you'll notice when we, when we try and work with the law this way, how quickly our debts actually get paid and how divine ideas rush to us to show us how those debts can be paid. Marcus Bach, who wrote the book Jonathan Livingston Siegel, said, Praise what you have, be it ever so little, and insist that it is constantly growing larger. This is the great secret. It's like plant food, sunshine, and water. You must bless what you have before you can expect any more than what you've got. What you're doing is then you are planting the seeds into fertile soil that has been prepared by your thought currents. So he says, nothing so quickly erases the thought of lack as the realization of divine love in your life or to you, through you, 
for you and as you. This is your love. Love will bring your own to you. Adjust your misunderstandings. Realize when you are talking story, when you are feeding the parasite mind, and have compassion so that you can loosen the grip and be able to feed yourself the nourishment of love and blessings that are there for you. He said, love is the fulfillment of the law. And as we look deeper into whatever we are in misunderstanding about, realize that it was often error thinking, either that which was given to us or through our own assumptions. He said, fill your mind with the all-sufficiency of this invisible realm that's always waiting for us to impress our thought seeds into the invisible realm to become manifest for ourselves. So the way is open for us to pay our debts. Surrender to God even in the face of the dragon and move instead into your heart where love dwells, where the all-sufficiency of God abides. So how much do you have? Well, we can't even count the ways. There are so much. There are so many. Our endless opportunity is to give God our business, our family affairs, our finances, to lead us out of debt and to lead us into the promise where God says, I come to give you life, and to give you life so much more abundantly than you could even imagine. So be open to new ideas that come, even when it feels like it's stretching you and taking you maybe a little out of your comfort zone. And the money may not show up all at once. By little by little, though, it does. And as our faith grows in this law, the quickening of the manifestation also grows as well. Because outer things conform to the inner blueprint. Riches are attracted to those who live close to the heart and mind of goodness, of God. And as we magnify our home, our hearts, our thoughts, our affairs, with the presence of God dwelling as the very foundation of all our interactions, then we have lasting prosperity. So a wonderful pray, prayer to pray is, God is my all-sufficiency in all things. You know, our physical senses can only show what has been, but not necessarily what will be. For that direction, we have to look within. So don't focus on how big the dragon may seem. Go to that storehouse of plenty that's in your heart. God will provide prosperity in your home, in your heart, and God will pay all your debts. So think of what you want to demonstrate and maybe not as much of what you want freedom from. And when you pray, thank God in advance for God's loving care, guidance, wisdom, love, and your privilege 
to enjoy it. And know that the universe conspires to assist you. So again, I when I ask, how much do you have? The 23rd Psalm answers that. The Lord is my shepherd, my provider, my protector, that guides my thoughts to the great I am and unburdens my mind. I shall not want because want indicates lack. But what I shall know is plenty and provision and abundance and blessings. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures into lavish abundance. He leads me beside still waters into that stillness where peace abides. He restoreth and reneweth my soul to see rightly, to give me strength. He guideth me in paths of righteousness, right use of his laws. For his namesake, which is proper use of the great I am that we each possess. Yea, though I walk through and not stay stuck in the valley of the shadow, the appearance of death, I will fear no evil, no error of thinking. For thou art with me always. And thy rod and thy staff, thy protection and thy provision, they comfort me, they encourage and they enliven me. Thou preparest a table before me and returns me to my true nature in the presence of mine enemies. My thoughts of error, my thoughts of misunderstanding. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, with blessings, with a deep joy as we realize that our overflowing provision comes up from a great and mighty love. My cup runneth over with abundance and blessings and surely goodness shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house, in the home, in the heart of the Lord forever. And so it is.